As a community, in the recent years, we have spent a lot of time talking about the scaled frameworks. Instead of investigating how large and successful organizations scale agility, each one in their own unique way, and trying to find a common set of underlying principles. The Agile at Scale Generative Principles we are presenting are inspired by Lean and Agile Principles, by the realization that organizations are complex adaptive systems, and by the analogy of organizations as living organisms. Our session is really about starting the right conversation within the community and inviting contributors like yourself to improve and perfect the principles. We would like to start saying thanks to the many contributors that have already helped us with the principles. On your screen, you can see a QR code and a tiny URL. During this presentation, there will be more of those, all linking to relevant resources. I'm Giovanni, I'm a principal consultant at Zulk Engineering in London, and I have about 25 years of professional experience. Uh, I've been working with Agile since the beginning of 2001. I come from a technical background, but in the last seven years, I spent most of my time actually helping challenge large-scale Agile projects to get back on track. Uh, the typical ones were in size from, say, five to ten teams, but I worked on some quite large ones. In particular, the biggest one was about 70, 80 teams, so 800 people uh, distributed in a couple of continents. And the uh, most big recent one uh, was last year, uh, it was 500 people in about 50 teams distributed across three continents. My name is Luca Minudel. I have a technical background and 20 years of experience in professional software development and digital products development. Almost all of them with lean and agile ways of working. Talking about scaling, I would like to mention two experiences today. One is with Ferrari Formula One racing team and the other is with ThoughtWorks. In Ferrari, you don't pursue agility by choice, but by necessity. And this happens in the whole organization beyond software development. For example, for the development of the car or in race control operations. ThoughtWorks is a large organization with 42 offices in 15 countries. And the whole organization is run following lean and agile principles. We will now start with some premises to set the context. The manifesto for agile software development does not have an opinion about agile at scale. In fact, in it, you won't find any mention of delivery efforts involving uh, many teams or many products or the whole organization, or any mention of the words large or scale, because Agile has no opinion about this. So we claim that scale Agile frameworks fall short of achieving sustainable agility and some are band-aid solutions and others actually deleterious. Why do we say that? Which is, is a quite a strong statement. Well, first of all, every framework assumes an explicit or implicit context in which the framework works best. And if the context of your project or company does match that, chances are the framework will be more of an impediment than an help. Also, if you scratch below the surface of case studies on scale framework adoptions, you will hardly find any evidence of real business benefits. And in fact, there is a growing amount of anecdotal evidence 
about the ineffectiveness of these frameworks. In fact, then a growing number of experienced agile practitioners are actually giving up on these large-scale frameworks because they cannot recognize uh, agile in them anymore. Most of the company that succeeded in achieving agility at scale grew their own ways of working internally, experimenting, learning, adapting, and evolving their own way of working in an organic way. Agility here is intended as being fast, dynamic, innovative, flexible, adaptive, resilient, and with tangible and lasting benefits for the business. Organic way means harmonious, lifelike way, as opposed to a mechanic, machine-like way. None of these companies went through a scale agile transformation program, often a copy and paste one, a program that imply a fixed end state, a target operating model, an end date, and a roadmap predefined up front and sold in advance to the leadership. Indeed, we all know that the journey of achieving agility at scale never really ends, and its fundamental turns and twists reveal themselves gradually as you go, and they are best approached in an oblique way, not with a waterfall program. Let's have a look at how large and successful companies that are listed on the left side of your screen achieved agility at scale with tangible and lasting benefit for the business. All of them work using cross-functional teams, typically stable, long-standing, and with a lot of autonomy. All of these companies have a strong focus on technical excellence and the practices inspired by agile and extreme programming, such as continuous integration, trunk-based development, test automation, continuous delivery, and others. Their way of working is explicitly inspired or is congruent with lean and agile principles, the lean and agile values, and the mindset. All those companies have grown their way of working internally in an organic way, and they are constantly and continuously evolving their way of working. All those companies got ideas and inspirations from many original agile frameworks like Extreme Programming, Scrum, Kanban, Lean Startup, and they adapted those ideas to their context. None of them focus on one single framework by the book. None of them got any inspiration by scaled framework. None of them tried to scale by imitation or using a cookie cutter or one size fit all approach. Let's now compare the previous case study with these other case studies from companies that choose the path to go heavyweight. Let's look at what they did and with what results. Two companies adopted a heavyweight scaled agile framework. Their case studies have been presented as a successful adoptions. The two other companies replace strategic components of their technical platform, migrating to a heavyweight off-the-shelf software platform that is rigid, slow to modify and evolve, and so hinder agility. With what results they did it? Two of these companies faced the direct negative consequences for the business. Their business goals 
were disrupted and delayed, raising the concerns of stakeholders, investors and business analysts, and affecting the value of the company. Another company, after the adoption of the scaled framework and the release of the products developed with such framework, faced a sharp fall of 75% of the stock price. The company growth was arrested, and analysts also noticed a lack of innovation. While we know that correlation doesn't imply causation, we can definitely say there were no positive business impact whatsoever. The last company has completed the transformation recently, so it is too early to comment on any positive impact for the business, even if it was described as a complete success. In the language used in the case study, in the way success has been described, and in the changes that has been documented, there is no one single sign of a, an agile mindset. Quite the opposite, the presence of a traditional mindset seems even amplified. The two companies that try to replace strategic components of their platform with the heavy weight of the chef software platform clearly moved in the opposite direction of technical excellence, failing their objectives. The other two companies that adopted an heavyweight framework show no attention and no focus on the technical excellence in their case studies. Finally, case studies related to the adoption of the heavyweight scale framework show a reduction on the team's autonomy, with the delegation of authority to several layers of management. Overall, the difference with the previous companies that achieve agility at scale is pretty evident. We assume you know the Agile Manifesto, so we won't repeat it here. And modern management science is built around a branch of complexity called uh, theory of complex adaptive systems and applied to organizations. It treats an organization as a living system with people at the center, just like in Agile. And complexity sense has been used to explain why Agile works, as well as to borrow concepts such as self-organization. And now we will tell you a little bit about complexity and complex adaptive systems. This is a two minute, very high level introduction to complexity thinking and complex adaptive system. In a complex system, there are many people and many technical components connected in a social network and in a network of technical dependencies with a lot of complex interaction. There are boundaries such as affiliation and membership that define who is in and out, and interaction with the outside world such as partner, customer, regulator, consultants, and then energies coming in such as the pressure of work to do that is turned into new feature and emergent behavior. A complex adaptive system is a complex system where agents are people that have the fundamental ability to adapt to continuously changing circumstances and learn and evolve. How to manage in a complex adaptive system then? Here are a few examples. Look at the people and the organization as a living organism to attend to. Create an environment that supports self-organization. Align its driving forces the incentives with the purpose of the team and the organization, and create a safe to fail environment where people and teams can experiment, learn, adapt, and evolve. Foster interrelationship and interactions, amplify the beneficial one and deal down the one that are not beneficial. Act at the boundary of the system, shape the environment where the work happens, sense and respond.
Do you really, really need to scale? We will now present our nine principles to help you decide. The first four principles test the need for scaling. In fact, as we'll see later on, we'll discover that scaling is not always a necessity. There are other things that can be done instead. The first principle is the fundamental law of scaling. It suggests that scaling amplifies what's not working and the existing problems and makes the good more difficult. What companies really want to scale is their impact, for example, increase their revenue, their profit, and their productivity. When they increase the size, though, what was not working well is likely to get worse. For example, existing bottlenecks get worse. Resources that were scarce become even scarcer. For example, test environment and the availability of specific experts. The communication costs and inefficiencies grow rapidly. As a consequence, misunderstanding, suboptimal decisions and delays become more frequent. And what was working well, like practices, way of working and tools, are also likely to degrade or stop working because of the scale. There are a lot of things that organization can do to scale the impact and the productivity before considering scaling the size and feeling the pain. Accidental dependencies and tangling found in digital products and in the software increase the scale of people needed to get the job done. And in the vast majority of cases, they are detrimental and painful. Taming those problems increase the organization efficiency by an order of magnitude, to the point that scaling is not needed anymore. On the other side, scaling without taming those problems will make them get worse, and no benefits will come from scaling. In nature, scale can be a distinctive advantage. Scale also comes with associated costs. A natural equilibrium between costs and advantages lead to the ideal scale. But in software and digital product development, these economy of scale are the most common. As a consequence, the rule of thumb is to avoid bunching unrelated problems into the same bucket. Decompose problems that have been accidentally or artificially joined up. Remove accidental dependencies and relax the essential one. And align the teams with the product service capabilities and the underlying technology, as per the Conway law. The third principle suggests to constantly reduce accidental complexity. Taming accidental complexity can increase the organization efficiency by an order of magnitude, to the point that there is no need for scaling anymore. Scaling without taming accidental complexity in advance will make things get worse, and so there will be no benefits from scaling. To reduce accidental complexity, one can increase technical excellence and simplicity in order to reduce the amount of work, to reduce defects and consequently fixes, and to simplify and speed up the work by orders of magnitude. One should also reduce technical complexity to reduce the coordination effort and vice versa. Otherwise, technical complexity and coordination efforts will increase in a vicious circle. The other suggestion coming from this principle is to find a likely inefficiency across functional silos and replace them with agile teams. Teams that are small, autonomous, cross-functional, long-standing, owning and running their products or services. So far, we have seen that a lot of efficiency can be gained without scaling. Scaling is a huge effort and shouldn't be undertaken unless it is necessary. 
but we have seen a lot of company scaling without a real reason. For example, because everyone else is doing so, or because someone is selling the idea that Scaled Agile is the latest and the greatest version of Agile, but it is not. Or because the company is big, even though the business unit or the department working on its products is not so big to need scaling. So let's start with why and let's validate the reasons for scaling. After applying the principles number two, untangling unrelated problems, and principle number three, reducing accidental complexity, only then the organization can see if the need for scaling is really there. Usually, compelling reasons to scale include to scale the impact, to achieve fitness for purpose, or to respond to indicators that are signaling that now is the right time to scale. Instead, do not scale to scale the sites, do not scale prematurely, and do not scale in anticipation of demand, because it makes things worse, not better or faster or more efficient. The remaining five principles are pointers toward a direction of travel, to successfully scale in a sustainable way. Principle number five tells to scale effective collaboration, not just processes and structures, and not by imitation. What makes scaling work is people and team autonomy, people interaction and collaboration, people interrelationships and information sharing and creating an environment that supports all these in a way that fits the company's specific context and circumstances. Scaling by imitation of processes and structures from another company or imitating a scaled framework is at best useless and more likely it is deleterious. Why do we say that, which is, is a quite a strong statement? Well, first of all, every framework assumes an explicit or implicit context in which the framework works best. And if the context of your project or company does match that, chances are the framework will be more of an impediment than uh, an help. When scaling the size of the organization, processes start to break soon tools and practices follow. People is the key to scaling. Ensure their competence, give them the autonomy, the information and the means, and remove the obstacles to let them shape and grow their own processes and practices, and select, configure, evolve their own tools. Structures and processes are easy to copy, but less relevant. The relevant interrelationship instead cannot be easily copied. You have to grow them, amplifying those that work for you and reducing the others. People are the most adaptable element of an organization. The more complex the system is, the more fundamental is the role of smart people. Grow a learning organization with an experimental mindset. Break down collaboration barriers both horizontally across functions and roles and vertically, combining a top-down and a bottom-up approach and foster feedback loops. Collaboration is an amplifier of creativity. Harness human ingenuity and creativity, incentivize collaboration, shift the mix of people from followers to changers and creators to support autonomy. People with an intrinsic motivation and leaders are needed. The six principles make us reflect on the fact that until there is something small that works well, there is nothing to scale. It suggests us to start small, simple, and make it work. John Gall tells us that the complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. 
This idea of starting small and proceed with iterative incremental refinement permeates Agile. This principle and simplicity have always inspired Agile. We can see that in the 10th principles of the manifesto. Simplicity, the art of maximizing the work not done, is essential. Or in the idea of simple design for software development from extreme programming. Or in the idea of the prioritization of the scope, the minimum viable product idea, or the Pareto principles applied to the value of user story. We can see that also in the lightweight objective used for the original Agile frameworks. Since simplicity is the essence of what makes up agility, and since Agile is simple, achieving agility at scale should be even simpler. An effective way to scale is to create many autonomous units, each one capable to deliver autonomously a strategic business goal. The way to do that in a complex world is experimenting, learning, adapting and evolving. Micromanaging the tasks, the work, the dependencies and the coordination doesn't scale at all. To scale, follow the Lean and Agile values, principles and mindset and the theory from complex adaptive systems. You all know very well Lean and Agile principles, so now I will give you a quick overview of the principles of complex adaptive systems relevant to scaling. Don't add more people to existing teams. Instead, create diverse autonomous units, for example, teams, departments or business units. Self-organization, let alone, can go anywhere. Think about weather storms or forest fires. Align incentives, rewards, constraints to the purpose of the system to orient self-organization. Facilitate the creation of interaction protocols. Amplify those beneficial and reduce the others. Allow ad hoc collaboration among diverse autonomous units and ad hoc reporting, instead of aggregating them by standardization. Let each autonomous unit self-organize and be different, to best fit their specific context and circumstances, while preserving an overall coherence of identity of the old system. Distribute information, sense-making and consensus building. Disintermediate decision-making. Let further structures and behaviors and properties emerge from the interaction. And find the right level of granularity of the unit of the system, for example, team, departments or business units. What this principle says is that there is always an upper bound to that throughput, implying that there is a limit to the number of teams that can be added productively. And also, when the limit is reached, the throughput will decrease more than linearly with each newly added team. Uh, the main reason for that is that an initiative with several teams is a concurrent system, therefore is subject to the same constraints, and specifically to Amdahl's law, which says that the total time necessary to deliver a set of features is more than the total time spent in the sequential activities performed to deliver them. Uh, sequential activities in this, in this context are activities that cannot be split into concurrent tasks, and uh, so causing teams to wait for each other. So, for example, exclusive usage of shared environments, merge of changes in uh, codes shared by different teams, or time spent in meetings to synchronize the work among teams, or any other interaction that causes one or more teams to wait for others to finish something. And um, you know, in this context, the architecture of the system deserves a special mention as uh, it is, uh, according to Conway's law, one of the biggest factors defining the way teams communicate and synchronize. 
and therefore having a big impact in the ability of the initiative to scale. In fact, uh, sometimes changing the architecture of the system is the best way to increase the scalability of the initiative. Unfortunately, there is no formula to calculate the maximum number of teams in advance. However, as we'll see in the next slide, there is an empirical way to do that. Scaling an organization is a complex endeavor. Uh, the direction of travel gradually unfolds as you go. And this is also uh, unique to the organization-specific context and always changing circumstances. So it's fundamental to continuously look at where you are going to be able to correct course as necessary. And indicators are the instruments to help you achieve that. Uh, by providing the feedback you need to assess the effect of your decisions in an objective manner. In fact, without indicators to help you, you will be assessing your decisions only based on gut feelings, which may be biased and incorrect. It is very important to base indicators on a mix of metrics that balance each other. So, for example, throughput and lead time with open defects and technical depth to make sure they give you a full picture of, of the situation. You should also have indicators based on uh, appropriate mix of quantitative metrics, like, as I said before, throughput, technical debt, uh, open defects, lead time, but also qualitative ones, like team morale and customer satisfaction, for example, as they will give you a different perspectives on what is happening in the initiative. Finally, be careful with using metrics to set targets. Uh, so, for example, a typical one is the minimum test coverage of 80%. As they may, may be gamed, uh, making the metrics and the indicators using them useless. In conclusion, some downs of scaling. Don't use a scaled agile framework, especially the heavy one like Safe and Dead. Instead, all the large and successful companies grew their own way of working without using any scaled framework. Don't constrain yourself to one framework and buy the book. Instead, Take ideas and practices from all lightweight agile framework such as Scrum, XP, Kanban, and the others. Don't commit to one size fits all way of working. Don't use cookie cutters for team and reporting. Instead, allow diversity and fitness for purpose. Don't start big. Do not design and set an end state a target operating model and an end date, as in a waterfall program. Instead, continuously and gradually evolve, learning as you go. And now, a few do's of scaling. Focus on people and drive the evolution both top-down and bottom-up at the same time. Many large and successful companies started bottom-up at the team level, introducing the key concept and the building blocks first. Focus on technical excellence and on technical agility and align incentives and goals. Many large and successful organizations had a strong focus on technical excellence and technical agility. Indeed, it is the foundation for business and organizational agility. There cannot be business agility or organizational agility without technical agility. Clean the mess, untangle unrelated problems and accidental dependencies. Make it work in the small, starting with those capable and willing, and build upon your successes. Find the right level of granularity of the key organizational units and decide when you want to focus on the team 
on a product, service or capability area or on a business unit. Scale by composition of diverse and autonomous units and follow the principles. Monitoring the impacts of scaling. How the Agile at Scale generative principles compare to other similar ideas available out there. In the document of the Agile at Scale generative principles, you will find a medium level of details. They are actionable and context specific for software and digital product development, and they are based on a mix of hands on experience and theory. Out there, you will also find the enterprise agile manifesto.org and the scaling manifesto.org. They are both extremely high level, generic, and abstract. Two valuable resources that I would suggest to you as a source of inspiration and learning are the following one. The first is Organic Agility from Dave Snowden and Andrea Tomasini. This idea is not specific for software or digital product, but it is very detailed and has a very strong and solid foundation on complexity theory. And this is the reason why I would suggest to you this resource. The other resource is the Fractal Work Manifesto, including the book Introducing Your Invisible Manager from Andrew Holm. This idea is also not specific for digital products, but it is a theory-inspired journey of turning around the failing organization with the real and tangible benefit for the business and a huge improvement in productivity. Here you will find ideas and inspirations on incentive, people, collaboration protocol, tool practices, and scaling. Giovanni and I have now completed this introduction of the nine principles that inspire, inform, and orient the journey of digital organizations that want to be agile at scale. Below you see the link of the online document with all the principles described in detail. The only thing that is left now is to visit the link Add any comment you like to the principles, suggest improvements, and if you want, to share the link and discuss the principles with us and with others.